Planning to visit a Corps of Engineers lake soon? Regardless of how well you swim, you could find yourself in a fight for your life due to unexpected conditions such as waves, current, exhaustion, or injury. Remember, swimming abilities are likely to decrease with age, so don't overdo it. It takes an average of 60 seconds for an adult to drown and just 20 seconds for a child. Are you next? Expect the unexpected, don't overdo it, and choose to wear your life jacket. You are here in White River Country. Welcome, and as hospitable Ozarkers used to say, get down and set a spell. This is a story of a great and beautiful river and of its people, past and present. The Indians called it Unica. Spaniards said Le Rio Blanco. French mapmakers recorded it as La Riviera Blanc. We call it the White. All of these names refer to clear water. Clear, not quiet, not peaceful, not serene. Eons ago, before there was a white river, shallow seas covered these lands, depositing trillions of tiny marine creatures and plants. Limestone layers were slowly formed. You can see these layers and highway cuts in this area and on Baird Mountain southeast of the Dewey Short Visitor Center, on hillsides, around campsites, and along the water's edge. Fossil rocks are still found now and then. La Riviera Blanc begins life as a small spring bubbling out of a rocky mountainside in the Boston Mountains east of Fayetteville, Arkansas, about 2,000 feet above sea level. As it makes its way to the sea, waters of some 10,000 springs flow into the White River and its tributaries. This water seeping through the soil is mildly acid, enough to dissolve cavities in the limestone layers, forming some of the most beautiful caverns in the world. About 10,000 years ago, the first human inhabitants, very primitive Indian people, found the White River. Bluff dwellers were known on the river 3,000 years ago, existing on overhanging bluffs. They were gone, no one knows where, long before the first white men came up the river. Those white men were at first Spanish treasure seekers, then came the French explorers and trappers. There were adventurers, traitors, and squanderers who poled and paddled their way up the river. Few of them ever remained in one place. Early settlers, dreamers perhaps, sought their own new frontier. They were dominated by the struggle for survival, for food, water, and shelter, and against common enemies, not the least of which was the river itself. Steamboats were shuttling goods and people to the Ozark Highlands by 1850. They found great beauty in the woods along the white. They saw the loveliness of flowering trees and plants, of trees mirrored in the water, of lichens and ferns along the trail, and of the many creatures of wood and river. This was a new land to be wrestled and fought until it was tamed. The early settlers found great stands of hardwoods in the swampy bottomland, and softwoods covered the rolling hills as far as the eye could see. Small mills, called peckerwood mills, sprang up. Millions of board feet of lumber were sawed, and pine, oak, and cedar were rafted downstream. Around the turn of the century, railroads began to serve the area, and river traffic, except for sport and recreation, died. The river remained always a boundary, always a threat. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was introduced to the White River in 1870 when it operated snag boats to remove debris and other navigational hazards from the river. Work on a series of locks and dams followed the snag removal campaign. By 1900, serious farming had begun on the bottomlands along the Lower White. The Corps of Engineers cooperated in the construction of a series of levees, 
hopeful of reducing flood damage to the farmers, but it was hopeless to expect levees to control this river, the runoffs, the erosion, and soil losses. The land clearing and deforestation claimed an inevitable toll. Flooding became more frequent and severe, and the White River Valley suffered the destruction of homes, business, and crops, not to mention lives. The floods of 1927, 1943, and 1949 were especially devastating. The quality of life for many Ozarkers was little better than that of their homesteading ancestors. Early in the 20th century, a private company built a small hydro-powered dam at Power Site above Forsyth, creating Lake Tanicomo. It did little to control flooding, but it did hold back water for a time, allowing people to move out of the bottomlands. After the disastrous flood of 1927, area citizens began pleading to congressmen for funds to help them. Finally, in 1938, Congress passed the Flood Control Act, authorizing the construction of Norfolk Dam and Greer's Ferry Dam on tributaries of the White River. Authorization of Bull Shoals Dam and Table Rock Dam on the White River was added in 1941. The Corps of Engineers was given a mission on the White River and other waterways like it to carry out a comprehensive plan of aid to navigation and flood control, the generation of hydropower, water supply for community and industrial use, recreation, and areas selected for impoundments, and the conservation of fish and wildlife of all things great and small. But the dams had to wait a while. World War II came along, and then the Korean War. Finally, on October 10, 1952, the first spate of earth was turned for the Table Rock Project. My name is Jim Marlowe. In 1956, when I came to Branson to work on Table Rock Dam, I was as wet behind the ears as our baby daughter's diapers. Hired by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers by mail to work as a civil engineer on the project. When we drove into Branson that hot August day in 1956, no one could perceive how Table Rock would change the face of this country and the lifestyle of its people. To give you an example of my vision, I remember commenting to my wife as we drove past a small sign advertising Marble Cave. They've got a hard row to hoe if they think they're going to make any money out of that hole in the ground, which is now part of Silver Dollar City. Change the face of this country? Highway 165, which comes to Table Rock Dam from Branson, was an access road constructed by the Corps of Engineers so we could get supplies and materials from the railhead over the ridge to Roark Creek Valley to the dam. Many of the highways in the area had to be improved, relocated, or just plain built. Many bridges were constructed to raise highways above the level of the new lake, which is far above the level of the White River. On my first day on the job, I took a look at the dam from the hill where our construction offices were located. Three weeks passed before I actually got down to the dam site to take a look at what we were building. When I did, my feeling was one of absolute awe. You could look at plans and read dimensions and conceive in your mind an idea of size, but to see what it actually was, how massive and gigantic it was, made me feel very small. By the 1950s, the Corps of Engineers had made the transition from pre- to post-World War II construction techniques. Construction had evolved from using slicks behind mules to haul dirt and wagons to haul rocks to a motorized, mechanized business. We had heavy excavators and hauling units. Lower and upper cableways stretched across the valley for placing material out in the middle of the area. All the rock you see on the face of the dam and the aggregate to mix with the concrete came from Baird Mountain, that carved up chunk of rock that towers over the valley just south of the dam. Rather than use a fleet of trucks, 
The contractor chose to construct a conveyor system to get that rock and aggregate from Baird Mountain to the dam, a straight line distance of one and a half miles. How much rock and aggregate? The concrete section of the dam is 1,602 feet long, five football fields plus 35 yards and contains 1,230,000 cubic yards of concrete. The embankment section is 4,821 feet long and contains 3,320,000 cubic yards of rock and dirt fill. When you consider the mass of the dam and its length, a fair comparison would be five Empire State Buildings laid end to end. A dam such as Table Rock is constructed in blocks or lifts to an engineer. The segment shown here is a lift. The entire stack of lifts is called a monolith. The first bucket of concrete, eight cubic yards, was placed in May of 1955. And the dam itself was completed in August of 1957. At the batch plant where the concrete was mixed, 150 cubic yards of concrete were produced every hour. And it still took more than two years to do the job. About 500 workers were employed in building the dam, with 35 of them being Corps of Engineers personnel. Many of the workers were locals from Taney and Stone County and from Springfield. Table Rock was not without its problems. One was the weather. Perhaps strangely, hot weather made the job more difficult. In cold weather, all you had to worry about was keeping your hands warm and the concrete above the freezing point. In hot weather, we had another problem. The quantity of concrete, mass concrete, generates heat from the chemical reaction of cement and water and from other materials. The heat can get so high that expansion of the mass will destroy the concrete. So, it had to be kept cool. How? Ice. An amazing amount of ice was used in the water used to mix the concrete. There were, unfortunately, injuries in the building of Table Rock Dam. The Corps expended an immense amount of effort to make the project safe. But, in the construction of anything as big as Table Rock, as high, over a long period of time, accidents are going to occur. There were deaths, two of them. One person slid all the way down the face of the dam on a scaffold. Amazingly, he survived the ride. Working on a dam such as Table Rock, the last thing an engineer thinks of is a cemetery. But cemeteries gave us one of our biggest problems. We were dealing with families of people who were buried in cemeteries which would be flooded, and they had to be relocated. When you deal face to face with people and cause them emotional problems because you must exhume those bodies from sacred ground and move them to new locations, it was and is traumatic. Nine small cemeteries were emptied and consolidated into Bowman Cemetery. The most dramatic problem during the construction of the dam very nearly didn't happen. The flood of 1957. When the water began to rise that spring, the dam was a considerable way from being complete. The contractor did his best to finish the dam before the water topped out, but he didn't make it. It was darn close though. If you had been there to see the amount of work that was done between February and May, you would have been amazed. The race was on. As the water would rise, more lifts would be completed getting ahead and above the water just in time. The water would inch up again and the dam would be pushed higher. Finally, the water won. In May, the water came shooting over the top and for a few weeks the local area had a brand new attraction, a man-made waterfall. The delay and damage at the dam site were minimal, even though it was spectacular. The major problems occurred upstream in the reservoir area where workers would not be prepared for the water to rise for another nine months. Many things went underwater, including many of the roads being relocated. 
a military ferry was brought in from Fort Leonard Wood in central Missouri to keep traffic open in what is now Kimberling City. The old bridge was underwater, and the new bridge was not ready. The flood also inundated property that the Corps of Engineers had not yet acquired. We discovered that when you flood property you do not own, it causes quite a stir. I didn't go up there during the period of flooding. Even a young engineer knows how many shotguns there are in this country. The flood of 1957 showed clearly one of the two primary reasons for the Table Rock Dam, flood control. It was the first benefit of the Table Rock project. It was not the last. The cost of Table Rock when completed was $66,116,000. If the project were to start today, the estimated cost would be $350 million. Still, for a project costing $66 million, there must be benefits, and there have been benefits. Through 2002, based on average White River statistical data, Table Rock has saved people and communities in flood costs they did not have to pay, approximately $106 million. But there is another benefit of Table Rock Dam, one that, like flood control, will continue to work for America and reap many millions of dollars. That benefit is hydropower. We are an energy-hungry world, and our supply of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas is limited. Hydropower is produced from a renewable resource, water. The water in Table Rock Lake is released through passages called pinstocks to turbines. The force of the water on the turbine blade drives the turbine, which in turn drives generators to produce electricity. Hydropower cannot meet all of our energy needs. Hydroelectric production in the United States supplies only four and a quarter percent of all the electricity produced by utilities in the nation. This is the equivalent of burning more than five billion gallons of oil or the output of 20 average size nuclear plants. But hydropower's greatest asset is its instant availability to meet power demands during peak periods of electrical use, such as hot summer afternoons. Coal burning or nuclear plants must be kept in continuous operation, but hydroelectric facilities such as Table Rock can be stopped and started almost instantly and used again and again. If you were to dump a gallon of water in the White River near its source, that gallon of water would produce electricity at Beaver Dam, at Table Rock, at Power Site, and at Bull Shoals. And remember too that hydropower is the cleanest of all the various types of energy production. The Corps of Engineers has long been known as a producer of hydropower. Core projects, such as Table Rock, produce about 87 billion kilowatt hours of electricity annually. That is about one third of the total hydroelectric energy production in the United States. Flood control and hydropower, these were the primary considerations in the construction of Table Rock Dam. But since the lake filled, another extremely important benefit has evolved, recreation. Table Rock is the most heavily used lake in the Little Rock District, with more than six million visitors recorded each year. A system of campgrounds, marinas, and swimming areas make it a happy playground during the spring, summer, and fall, and yes, even winter. A strict and far-reaching management plan had helped to make Table Rock one of the most beautiful lakes in the nation. Since the completion of Table Rock Lake, the surrounding communities have experienced explosive growth in population, schools, work opportunities, and tourism. All these things were just beginning when I left Table Rock to move on to another project. We loved the White River Country when we came here. An engineer has a unique affection for his first project. There have been other projects for me since Table Rock for which I am proud, but not like Table Rock. My daughter was one and a half years old when we came here, and to this day, Table Rock is Daddy's Dam. In truth, it is your dam, your lake. Enjoy it safely. As you do, remember it is working for you and will be for many years to come as we all try to make the wisest uses of the resources of the White River.
the beauty of the woods and waters that the early settlers saw is still around us. If you help us, the Corps of Engineers promises that the bounties given to us by La Riviera Blanc will be utilized and enjoyed by generations yet unborn.